those samples t-test can answer useful questions. For example, where can we get more money, working in a factory or in the IT industry? So let's learn how to make sure t-test is a correct test for our data, how to get all these results with one simple command, how to interpret all these results, and finally see what happens if we choose a wrong test. We'll compare 10 random IT workers with 10 random factory workers. First of all, we'll see that on average IT crowd earns more than folks in the factory. But is average actually a good choice? That question is important because comparing averages only makes sense if the data is normally distributed. While if data is not normally distributed, an average would not represent our data well. So it's obvious that we need to check for normality. For that, we'll use the normality function from the lookup package, which conducts Shapiro Wilt normality tests with every sample. High p values in both samples indicate that our data is normally distributed. So now we're sure that using a parametric t test is the right choice. However, the normality alone is not enough to make a right decision because there are two different t-tests, student's t-test and Welsh's t-test. In order to choose the right test, we need to understand variants of our data. And here is why. Even very different means with huge variants may not be significantly different, while even very similar means with small variants can be significantly different. So the variances between two samples can be either different, sometimes called heterogen, or similar, sometimes called homogen. And we need to know which one is true, because a classic student's t-test can be applied only when variances are similar, while two samples with different variances should be analyzed with Welch t-test. Levine's test for homogeneity of variance helps to decide which t-test to use. The Levine test function from card package shows a small p-value, which tells us that our variances differ and that we need to use Welsh t-test. And the best way to compute our test, in my opinion, is the ggbtwinstats function from gdstatsplot package, which needs only five arguments. First, our data d, which we just created, with x as the grouping variable job and y being wages of people. Then, since our data is normally distributed, we'll choose a parametric type of statistical approach. And since our jobs have different variances, we set var equal argument to false. Such simple command results in this statistically rich and publication-ready plot. Now let's interpret the results. Welsh t-statistics is the measure of similarity between compared samples, measured in units of standard error. The further t-value is from zero, the more different are the samples. But t-value by itself cannot say how far from zero is far enough to conclude that this difference is significant. That's why t-value and the degrees of freedom were previously used to get a p-value. But nowadays every software delivers p-values by default. Our p-value of 004 shows a moderate evidence against the null hypothesis that mean salaries are similar in favor of the alternative hypothesis that average salaries differ. Particularly, IT crowd gets $35,000 on average more than factory workers. But is a difference of $35,000 large? A p-value cannot tell that. A p-value only checks whether there is a difference, but not how large this difference is. Fortunately, ggbtwinstats provides hedges g as the measure of the effect size, which shows how large the difference in salaries is. Hedges g is interpreted in the same way as Cohen's d effect size, but outperforms Cohen's d for small samples, like in our example. Our effect size of minus 0.96 is large and tells us that the difference of $35,000 is literally large. Well, the effect size is cool, but not particularly intuitive, right? Luckily, GD between stats provides the Bayesian difference between our samples with 95% highest density intervals as the second and more intuitive measure of the effect size. The difference is intuitive but neither difference nor effect size do not test hypothesis. 
And that's what the bias factor is for. Our bias factor, which is conceptually similar to the p-value, is kind of small. A bias factor of minus 0.84 indicates that the difference is not worth more than the bare mention, which is similar to a moderate evidence against the null hypothesis found by the frequency statistics on the top of the plot. But how can it be that both the effect size and the difference are large while this difference is hardly significant? Well, this happens often, and here is why. First, some factory workers still earn more than some of the IT guys. Secondly, we only have 10 people in each sample, which is simply not enough to conclude that our huge difference appeared not by accident. Let me prove it to you. If we double the number of people per group, the frequentist effect size and the Bayesian difference remained almost the same, while both p-value and bias factor became very significant and showed a strong evidence against the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Thus, a p-value and the effect size never contradict each other, simply because they show different things. And if our p-value is around 005, like 004 in our example, Ronald Fisher, the father of modern statistics himself, recommended to treat such result as suggestive or inconclusive and collect more data. And that's all we can do. What we cannot do, however, is to use a wrong test. And there are three ways things can get messed up. First, if we are lazy to check the normality of data, we'll go straight to the non-parametric man with u test. Here, a higher than the real p-value failed to reject the null hypothesis, failing to find the difference where difference actually exists. Such mistake is called type 2 error, or simply missing a discovery. Secondly, if we are lazy to check the similarity of variances, we'll go straight to the classic student's t-test, which assumes equal variance, and produces smaller than real p-value, indicating more evidence for the difference than necessary. Such mistake is called type 1 error, or simply discovering nonsense. But that's not all. We could be even more wrong if we took a pair t-test, because we would test a completely different null hypothesis. Namely, that exactly the same 10 factory workers change their job to IT and compare their salaries before and after this change. This is not the case in our example, but could be our next experiment. Then pair t-test would be absolutely correct. And if you want to understand it really well, check out this video.